Now when we're looking at the digits, we use the toe brachial index. So when do we perform toe pressures? If the ankle vessels are not compressible, we definitely want to obtain toe pressures. Of course, that's assuming the patient has toes. Sometimes if the ankle level waveforms are abnormal, but we get an, a normal ABI, then that's a clue that the vessels may be calcified and we want to take some toe pressures to verify that. If the patient has any non-healing ulcers or gangrene on the feet and toes, we want to check the toe pressures to assess for possible healing potential. And a lot of physicians will request toe pressures in all diabetic patients just because they're more likely to have calcified vessels. When assessing the digits, again, we typically obtain both pressures and waveforms just like we do with the um, extremities. And generally we use a PPG sensor for this. There are some PVR sensors um, for digital evaluations, but I think most places would use the photoplethysmography to do this. And various diseases can be diagnosed with a digital evaluation including Raynaud's and digital artery obstruction. Um, again, as I mentioned before, PPGs are not true plethysmographic instruments, which means they cannot be calibrated in volume terms. The infrared light is transmitted, which detects the light reflecting from the movement of the blood cells. And this is only from a depth of about one to three millimeters, so it doesn't go very deep, but they're very sensitive to the movement. And why do we do this? To evaluate distal perfusion if the patient has non-compressible vessels. And we can also predict the likelihood of healing after a vascular procedure. So if the patient has a bypass or even if they have an amputation, we can assess if they're going to heal or not. And a toe pressure of 50 millimeters of mercury or more is regarded as adequate for healing in the presence of diabetes. So the toe brachial index is calculated in the same manner as the ABI. So we take the toe pressure over the highest arm pressure to calculate the toe brachial index. Again, always the highest arm pressure. And these are just some criteria examples for a toe brachial index. Generally normal is over 0 0.8, 0 0.7 is normal. Less than 0 0.2 is critical. So, and then anything in between depends on the criteria you're using. So let's revisit our friends that we saw earlier. Here down at the bottom, we can see the digits. On this side, we have the sharp upstroke and the notch on both sides. And these are the digital pressures right here. So 107, 119, 107 over 149 equals 0 0.72. So depending on your criteria, this would be normal. And again, 119 over 149, 0 0.8. So that's normal. On this side, however, we can see these waveforms. This one's pretty rounded. And this one is nearly flat. So this person definitely has some uh, diminished flow. And on this side, their toe brachial index is 0 0.19, and this side 0 0.17. So this, uh, based on the criteria we just saw, these would be critically diminished on both sides. And again, with the PPG waveforms, we're concerned about artifacts. So if the patient's moving at all, you will get this raggedy appearance and any slight little movement. PPG sensors are extremely sensitive to movement. So if you see this, the patient was probably twitching. Another way to evaluate digital flow is with uh, transcutaneous oximetry. TCPO2 is used to predict wound healing or determine amputation level. It, me it does this by measuring the amount of oxygen diffusing through the skin from the dermal capillaries. They usually take uh, two to three measurements in different sites to get the best overall picture of the tissue. And it's performed generally with the patient lying flat. You can also add an oxygen challenge 
like putting them in a hyperbaric chamber, or you can obtain them with seated measurements if you want to assess them further. So while the patient's lying supine, if they have pressure over 35, that's probably going to heal pretty well. If it's between 10 to 35 millimeters of mercury, it may or may not do well, and less than 10 has a poor prognosis for wound healing. Laser Doppler is another way to evaluate the microcirculation. So for this, we put, place a fiber optic probe on the skin and place it under this cuff to hold it on. The Doppler shift is created when light hits moving blood cells, uh, much like the PPG waveforms. And then the changes in wavelength are directly related to the number and velocity of blood cells in that sample volume. So those are basics on uh, digital evaluation. We're gonna move on to the upper extremity. And of course we do some digital evaluation there as well. So with peripheral artery disease is the most commonly identified in the proximal subclavian artery. This is only found in about 1.9% of the general population. And most of these people are asymptomatic. So a lot of people have this and they don't even know it. And there's not really any difference in prevalence between the sexes. We can also test for digital artery obstruction with the PPG sensors again. And normally this happens from thromboemboli from the proximal artery or heart. And if they have a digital artery obstruction, warming the hand up or uh, giving the patient a nerve block does not have any effect on the flow. Another popular upper extremity test we do is for thoracic outlet syndrome. So generally this patient would have a cold, painful, or numb extremity when they change positions. Um, there can be partial or complete compression of the subclavian vessels or brachial plexus with arm position change. So you can see this, this is actually Noah Lowry. He was a pitcher for the Giants and his career ended because of thoracic outlet syndrome. And obviously, he had a repetitive motion, so repeated impingement over time can lead to intimal damage or thrombus formation. And definitely someone like a pitcher in baseball would re be repeating their motion very often. Another test we do is an Allen's test. So this is usually to assess for an incomplete palmar arch. Um, we can do this prior to radial artery harvest or AV access placement, or if the patient already has an AV access, we can check for steel with the Allen's test. Raynaud's is also a popular test that we do. And one of the difficult things with Raynaud's is differentiating between Raynaud's disease and Raynaud's phenomenon. So Raynaud's disease also known as primary Raynaud's, is caused solely by arterial spasm. So a person can get nervous if they get stressed or if they just get cold, their arteries overreact and they spasm up and then they have their symptoms. With Raynaud's phenomenon, also known as secondary Raynaud's, this is a combination of vasospasm and arterial obstruction or other instigating systemic factor. So that could be the person has lupus or another type of autoimmune disease that's affecting their circulation and they would have Raynaud's phenomenon. So it's very difficult to differentiate the two of these and it's not always something that we're able to do with the test. So they have to look at the whole picture of the patient and see what other things they have going on in their medical history to really figure this out. So the exams for all these pathology, we'll start out with PAD exam, and this is very similar to the lower extremities. We, put, we do the segmental waveforms first, whether you do PVRs or Doppler waveforms. For the PVRs, we put cuffs on the upper arm, forearm, and wrist. Or if you're doing Doppler waveforms, you get waveforms at the subclavian, axillary, brachial, radial, and ulnar arteries. Then once the waveforms are obtained, you get the pressures. 
And again, you start bottom to top. You start at the wrist, you obtain radial and ulnar, then you get a forearm pressure and an upper arm pressure. Then if we're doing further assessment, we'll use the PPGs. And we can test for digital obstruction, thoracic outlet, Raynaud's, and the Allen's test. There are a few limitations. So as with the lower extremities, if the patient has a bypass or an AV fistula, we do not want to put a cuff over that. We don't want to compress it. So that can affect how the test is done. Also, generally in patients with mastectomy, their physician will tell them not to have their blood pressure obtained in that arm anymore to avoid lymphedema. So usually we'll skip it if that is the case. Again, we cannot differenti differentiate stenosis and occlusion with these tests. We only can tell if there is disease or not. We can also not localize the obstruction precisely. It's a general idea of where the obstruction might be. And again, this is very repetitive. Just like with the ankles, it's the highest wrist pressure over the highest brachial. And with the fingers, the finger pressure in each digit over the highest arm pressure. <clears throat> highest brachial pressure, I should say. And there are not as many um, published criteria for the upper extremities. So generally, we either say it's either normal or it's abnormal for the wrist brachial index and for the finger brachial index. Wrist brachial index, again, if the pressure is over 250, this, the vessels may be calcified. And we see this a lot in patients with end-stage renal disease who are often diabetic as well. But um, definitely patients with end-stage renal disease can have calcified arm vessels. Just as with the lower extremity, the wrist brachial index must change by more than 0 0.15 to be considered clinically significant. So when you're following the patient, make sure that it's changed by that much before you say that uh, there's been a significant change. So when we do the segmental pressures, again, that's used to approximate the location of disease. Normal can be a change in less than 10 to 20 between segments and side to side. So in some places, they do use 10 millimeters of mercury as the cutoff for upper extremity testing. Some use 20, so that depends on the lab where you are interpreting. So abnormal must be more than 10 to 20 millimeters of mercury change between segments. So a change from the upper arm to the forearm would mean brachial disease. Forearm to wrist would be forearm disease. And then you must also compare contralaterally. So if a patient has a change from the right to left brachial, there is more than likely an obstruction proximally, probably in the subclavian arteries. So here are a couple of cases. This one is a PVR. So we see the sharp upstroke, the notch. Again, just like in the lower extremities. This one, you can see a little a decrease in the amplitude, but it still has the upstroke and the notch on both sides. So that's probably just because of the size of the, the cuff. And the wrist brachial index is 1.0, 1.1, 1.2, 1.1 on both sides. So that one's normal. And here's an example of a Doppler case. Here we have a triphasic waveform. Here's one, two, three. This is actually almost tetraphasic right here. One, two, three, four peaks. And here with the axillary, we can see it doesn't quite drop below the baseline. This is probably just because of the Doppler angle, like I mentioned earlier. It's difficult to get a good angle up in the uh, axilla. But this, you see the waveforms below are normal. So this is probably normal flow through here. And all the way through, we can see multiphasic on both sides. And again, normal wrist brachial indices bilaterally. Out, and the brachial pressures are equal as well. Here we have an abnormal case. So it's a 24-year-old female with right arm pain post right brachial artery puncture. 
So we'll just look at the left side really quick and we can see sharp upstroke and the notch all the way through normal wrist brachial indices so that side's fine but here we see a normal waveform up here but a pretty significant change from upper arm to forearm and as we see the pressures there's a decrease from 101 at the upper arm to 71 at the forearm so she definitely has an obstruction between the upper arm and the forearm on this side as a result of her brachial artery puncture and here her wrist brachial index so the machine calculates both but generally you use the highest one for interpretation so 0 0.78 is below our cutoff of 0 0.9 so that is abnormal and here on the same patient is a Doppler waveform so here we see multiphasic flow here this is again the angle issue multiphasic again but then we get to the radial and it's nearly flatlined. And here we have pretty good ulnar artery flow. So she definitely has some radial artery, probably a near occlusion here, because she does have some flow. Maybe collateralizing through the ulnar, that we can't really tell. All right, stress testing in the upper extremity. We don't really do exercise testing in the upper extremity, um, but we will perform some other maneuvers. So when testing for thoracic outlet syndrome, we'll have them move through a few position changes. We have them sit up very straight, attach the PPG sensors to a finger, or we can also use a Doppler signal at the radial or ulnar artery, if um, that's what our protocol calls for but I find the PPG sensor is um, a little easier to follow with the, the movements. These are just some examples of the movements. So first we'll take one of all the patients at rest. Next we get PPG signals with the patient arm at 90 degrees, so straight out to the sides. Then we have them raise their arms straight overhead next to the ears. Uh, military position is with the patient seated, palms up and their shoulders rolled back. So it's like they're sitting at attention. We'll do that um, with the head straight and then also have them turn their head right and turn their head left. Then last but not least, we have them put their arms in any position that they normally have symptoms. So if they have it while they're driving, while they're doing yoga, doing, you know, handstand push-ups whenever they have their symptoms that's how we have them in their position <clears throat> so here we have a case and this is a normal case we can see all the way through in every position here's our baseline sharp upstroke dichrotic notch on both sides they raise their arms to 90 degrees no real change at 180 we do see it does change a little bit the notch decreases some but it's still there and the amplitude is actually increased. So this, I think this is a result of the gravity with the arm straight overhead because this seems to happen in most normal patients. But then we move on to the military position and we can see no significant change in the waveforms all the way through. But then we see an abnormal case. Here's her baseline. Sharp upstroke, this is kind of a funny little notch right here, but it is there. Arms at 90 degrees, we can still see there's a notch on both sides. However, when she puts her arms straight overhead, we get almost a complete loss of signal. Then also in military position, same thing. Head turned to the right, returns a little bit, but it's still not back to normal and the left side is completely gone. Then with the head turned to the left, we actually see the opposite, where the left comes back a little bit, but the right's gone. And onset position in this patient was uh, with the arms behind her head as if she was just, you know, relaxing. <laughs> and she definitely had it there as well. On to the Allen's test. 
So for the Allen's test, we would take the PPG sensors and put them on the second and fifth digits. So you can do it separately or at the same time, depending on um, the resources you have available. And here we would assess the flow at rest in both digits, as well as during compression of the vessels and after release. So we would manu manually compress and hold the radial artery, then we would release and note any changes. Then we would compress the ulnar artery, hold and release, note any changes. And if the patient had an AV fistula or a graft present, we would also compress the graft if we were assessing for seal syndrome. So this is the one time we are allowed to compress a fistula. Anything else, we're not allowed to do it, but only when we're assessing for steel. If you compress the fistula and the flow increases, then you know there's a steel there. If you compress and nothing changes, then the patient probably does not have a steel. So here's a normal Allen's test. We can see moving through all the compressions and no significant changes. I know it says first digit, second digit, third digit, but this is actually with um, compression of each vessel. So here's at rest, here's radial artery compression, ulnar artery compression, release, oh sorry, radial compression, release, ulnar compression, release. So this person has a complete palmar arch. Now when we're testing for Raynaud's, we get waveforms in all 10 digits. So we do this at rest, then we have them place their hands in ice water for between two and five minutes. Then we obtain the waveforms again afterwards to see if anything has changed. And this, uh, if patient really has Raynaud's, they do not like the ice water test. It's very painful for a lot of people. So not that it's comfortable for anyone else, but especially if a person has Raynaud's, they don't like it at all. So we assess these at rest and after cold stress, you can also monitor them over time for return to baseline and see how long it takes. So here, this is a classic Raynaud's waveform. We have this upstroke and then this little notch right here is an early, early notch. And this is a textbook Raynaud's waveform right here. So this patient actually had this at rest then after the cold stress, you can see there's a significant decrease in the amplitude of the waveform. And again, on this side, here's normal digital flow at rest and a significant decrease after the cold stress. So at rest, this patient has relatively normal digital flow all the way through. Then over here we have the post-cold stress, and you can see there's a significant decrease in all the digits with cold stress. And here's our initial uh, digital study. This is after five minutes of rest on this side. So you can see there's been some improvement, but it's still not good digital flow all the way through. So they actually ended up warming up this patient's hands before they sent them home so they wouldn't be suffering. <laughs> and that's all for physiologic testing.